welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I am the actor. And my name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. I said that like there's some news on the horizon. Didn't it sound like I'm like, I am the actor. Well, do you have another play in the hopper? What do you got? No! I can't no. do it. No. Um, I did see a bunch of audition notices and I did read through them very carefully and I was like, nope, not a part for me. And there was a tad bit of disappointment and a tad bit of, oh, I'm good with that. <laughs> you know, like, You're like it's I'll, di- take, I'll take a breather. <laughs> well, it's not so much that. It's like if there's a part that I think that I am uh, adequate for or appropriate for, then if I don't do it, that bothers me. Okay. But when there isn't, you're like, oh, I'm relieved because you know, you can't put pressure on the fact that you're not a 13 year old, uh, African American female, you know, yeah. I'm, you're, I'm not that not your fault. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, well, we're going to talk about uh, a really cool movie that, uh, I was, I was excited to see because the last few years we've been watching the Palm d'Or winners and have been, uh, at least I have been, uh, you know, uh, excited and surprised about about those Palm d'Or winners. I think we kind of started around Parasite, and mm. then I think we've watched every Palm d'Or winner. And actually, your favorite movie of the year has been like multiple years in a row was the Palm d'Or winner because it was Parasite, and then also uh, Teton. So yeah, I mean that so good. Yeah. So and and that was in my top ten. But um, but yeah. Teton. So this one. <laughs> This one Sorry. is another French movie and also another movie uh, directed and, and co-written, at least, uh, by a French female uh, filmmaker, uh, Justine Trier. And this movie is called uh, Anatomy of a Fall. So it is, uh, it's in movie theaters now. Um, and it's about a woman who's suspected of murdering her husband, uh, set in like the French Alps. And uh, they have, her and her husband have a... Uh, not blind, but like a severely uh, uh, vision impaired son, um, and he's kind of the only uh, the only witness of of the incident. So is that's he? kind of the setup of the movie. Well, the dog is too. Yeah, ish. That's so. the key. And uh, so so yeah, and and uh, Fifty Cent makes a, an appearance. Uh, you know spiritually by his song P.I.M.P., which gets blasted like, for the first 30 minutes of the movie. <laughs> I was like, what? It's not, what it's movie not did I his see? version. Yeah. It's not his version. It's the uh, like a steel drum version. But yeah, it will definitely stick in your mind if you watch this movie. Um, but yeah, so um, wh- what did you know about this movie? Other, I tried to keep away from this movie other than I saw kind of like the the kind of uh, teaser trailer type of a thing where it's like, I have no idea what's going on other than like somebody fell and people think that his wife did it. Uh, who's played by Sandra Huller, by the way, who just is a knockout. Just amazing in this film, but Jeez. we'll get there. He's gonna quietly creep up. Oh, I like that. Remember when I was texting you after the film? Um, yeah. No, I didn't know anything about this movie other than you texting me and sending me uh, uh, a GIF, GIF uh, that said thumbs up or like peace it to was resistance. A, yeah, was, yeah, 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 yeah. It was a chef's kiss. And I was kiss. like, anatomy of a fall. What? And then I remember hearing about it. And I remember the Cannes Film Festival, and I started to connect the dots, but I was like, okay, it's playing. I'm going to go see it. I actually have time to see a movie. I'm going to go, because we were supposed to talk about The Killer, but it hasn't been released yet on my in my neck of the woods. And side note- Which is rele- amazing to me. You live in a decently sized city, I don't, and you have repertory theaters. Like You've got like places that- that would show the killer. I know it's being released on Netflix very soon. And by the time this episode comes out, it will be already be on Netflix. Yeah. But I, it was really awesome to see it in a movie theater. And well, they're going to release it here in the movie theater at the same time. They're (sighs) releasing it. Uh, All right. But I got rid of Netflix, so I have no other choice but to see it in the movie theater. So okay. it's All a right. win-win. So anyway, so you had seen that and wanted me, wanted to talk about that, but I, I couldn't see it. And I was like, I'll just go see Anatomy of a Fall. And I wasn't... Darn. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I wasn't even sure. <laughs> Shucks. I wasn't even sure we were going to talk about it. But afterwards, I was trying to downplay my reaction to it because I was blown away by this movie. And... Yeah. I, I was lit up, you know, I, I floated out of the theater and 
I was like, yeah, uh, maybe we should talk about this. I was trying to be all cool and collected <laughs> and stuff like that. And I was trying to be like, oh, uh, yeah, she's going to silently come in and possibly win the Oscar and watch out for the young young man because I don't think anybody's talking about the young kid as Oscar nominee. Yeah, he plays watch, Danielle, yeah. Watch His out name's for him. Milo Machado Griner, Great Griner? I don't know. Milo, it's probably Milo Machado Griner. Sounds good when you put that little accent on it. Anyway, so I was pleasantly surprised, but immediately just the crunch of the snow and the way that the that song gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Mm. You know something is up with this movie. You're not sure what it is. You're not sure what's going on. I had no idea. And then I think halfway through the movie, I had some kind of remembrance of somebody talking about this, either you or somebody. And But by that point, I was so engrossed and so there that I could care less what I had known about it or any preconceived notions because it drew me in and it has not let me go since. It is perplexing and complex. It transfixed me. So I'm glad we're talking about it because I have some ideas and I've, I think I have a couple different takes on it. Maybe yeah. a, a couple that some people are not talking about what went through my mind. And I'm not mm. saying it's like the right thought. It's just what went through my mind. So anyway, the long and the short of it is, is that this is the film that will silently come in on a whisper into the Oscars and everybody will be surprised if and when it starts to win the Oscars that it's nominated for. So we'll say, but I think, I mean, I definitely think it should win. It, it should be nominated at least for best original screenplay. Because, Absolutely. Whew, and I think that that's probably going to be the best place for it to fit in, but it may end up grabbing a, a best picture nominee. I don't know, but um, Sandra Holler has been in a lot of stuff She's a uh, like German Austrian uh, actress, I believe, and so um, it, just the way that Justine Strie has used her. I watched another one of her films, um, uh, Sybil, and um, it has uh, it has uh, Sandra Holler in in it as kind of like a smaller part, but it's an impactful part, and she has a really hard. She plays a, uh, in, in this movie, Sybil, she plays a, a director in a movie who's having to direct uh, her, like a male and female in, in a love scene. And the male is her partner and the female is a woman who her partner cheated on her with. Oh so, my like, gosh. It is a lot. It's a lot. And so she... In, in like she goes through a lot in, in just in that one scene but but just in the scenes that she's in in that movie like she's amazing in it like that that movie is another one of those complex movies like it would definitely be a movie to talk about too but um but this this film uh, specifically anatomy of a fall i think it's it's interesting because it kind of creeps in and it kind of comes in as a like oh this you know everybody loves true crime and you know this is a this is a true crime and it's like a it's a it's essentially a, a genre movie this is a courtroom drama you know but it's not like this is not a, a few good men you know this is not a time to kill like this is not any of those movies like this is a totally different movie that that brings you into the complexity, like like you said, and when you texted me, you know, you know, relationships are complex. I think that was your three word, uh, your three word review, and and that's that's it's true. I mean, it is it is something. There isn't a right answer. There isn't a, a specific, um, you know, this is exactly what happened. Like the don't go into this movie expecting to be spoon fed. Like. It just lays everything out, and it does it in such a, uh, uh, it does it in a gradual manner where we get introduced to these characters. And I didn't actually, because I specifically stayed away from anything associated with this movie uh, before I watched the movie. I didn't really realize how severe his uh, sight loss was until he was trying he was playing the piano and trying to learn that and he put that ipad like really close to his face and he zoomed in on the you know like a couple of notes at a time and like scrolling through and that's when i started to realize like okay this is a different thing because he kind of moves through with his dog snoop his, you know his his companion animal 
and you know that you you don't realize how important that dog is to him and to his ability to to live life until later on in the movie that's one of those things that gets revealed to you and there's other things that get revealed to you throughout the film um that make it even like once you feel like you have a handle on what's going on and and what's happening it it adds another layer and it's like, oh, she's a writer. Okay, now there's more information about some of the things that she's written. Whereas we as the audience didn't know that until now. And now we've got to grapple with that. So every time you kind of get hunkered down and like, okay, this is probably what happened. And that's, I think, where a lot of people are going to try to to enter this movie is, is it a whodunit? Like, did she do it or did she not do it? You know, and the thing that kind of bugged me did they do this at your screening where before the dot um, com yes yes yeah it's like who, did she do it dot com or something and it's like that's horrible to me like i hated that because right there that told me before i saw one frame of justine trey's film i knew that there wasn't going to be an answer and that kind of robbed me of the experience of having that like when you go into a movie, you don't know like what you, it, there's certain movies where, you know, you know that at the beginning of Die Hard that Bruce Willis isn't going to die. You know that at the beginning of the Avengers that the Avengers are going to win. Like, you know, there are certain things that you just know. Movies like this, uh, original films that aren't based on a book that you could have read or whatever, like you don't know what the end is going to be like. And, and that kind of robbed me. And I guess I'm robbing other people of this too. So maybe that's bad, but they're well, all going to get robbed of it because it's going to be at the front of every, of every showing of this movie. So I, I well. find it completely insignificant, completely, really? ins- completely. Um, because that's not what the movie's about for me. And we'll get into it. I do want to make a point yeah. about uh, the young boy, the young man uh, I couldn't figure out at first why he had such severely dark glasses on when he took the dog for a walk. And I was like, well, maybe snow blind, you know, because being snow blind is a true thing. And, you know, I, I being, thought that was just like French fashion. I don't know. No, no <laughs> I, I noticed it. And I thought, OK, well, maybe it's because it's this time of the day and the way that the sun reflects on the snow. You can get snow blind. You can lose your way and your perspective on the horizon based on the reflection of the light from. And plus, it can also hmm. hurt your eyes so i just thought it was that but i thought that's an awfully they're not sunglasses they're awfully dark and and the way that he was yeah yeah and the way that he was stepping he you Hmm. could tell he knew where he was walking but at the same time it was very cautious and then i just chalked that up to it being snow but then there's a few times and maybe this is in my mind remembering it because sometimes my mind remembers things because i want to remember it that way and then i watch the movie go again and i go no wait that would have been good, but that's not how it happened. But there's a point where they're walking in the snow and he kind of pauses for a split second and the dog stops. Mm. But the, it's not your typical, you know, uh, pet owner, pet heel. It's not mm. that. It's like the dog was making sure the kid could see, could, you know, uh, basically his uh, seeing eye dog, if you will. And so I noticed things like that in the beginning that registered, but. You're right. I didn't notice until he actually put something up. And I know somebody who has that kind of eyesight who can Mm. actually function as a human being. But when it comes to reading, they have to go like that to whatever they're looking at. They actually have to take their glasses off and look at like the side of a soup can or something or, uh, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. that size print. They can't see uh, perfectly. They still function as a you would never think anything other than seeing that that they had any issues so i you're right the way that they layered that in and how significant that becomes later on and as for uh spoilers we can say spoiler alert at this point but i Mm. honestly think this is one of those movies that you could talk about in front of somebody and they would go to see it and it would take 25 minutes before they even realized this was the same movie that they overheard two people talking about in at a party that it would not register because the film is so etched out brilliantly that you it attaches itself to you immediately and regardless of whether or not you knew what was coming next or whether or not you knew somebody's verdict on what had happened to her or whether or not somebody's opinion uh, influenced how you were going to see the film, that actually would be an interesting uh, study to tell people what you think is the verdict 
and see if that influences how they watch the movie because that's what this film is about. It's mm -hmm. about what people think, say, and do in relationships, how it influences other people. So my big reveal is not that I think she did it or didn't do it because I honestly think the film doesn't give you enough conclusive material either way. I did not for one split second think to myself, she did it. No, she didn't do it. You ever seen Doubt with uh, yeah. Phillips? Okay. I saw that on Broadway. I've seen that movie a couple times and I've seen a local community theater do it. And every single version and every single time, I think something different about mm. the priest. The first time I saw it, I was like, he didn't do it. Yeah, it was like, you know, because she says, I have doubts at the end. But the first time I saw the movie, and there's some interesting clues that John Patrick Shanley puts into that movie that I think indicate what he wants you to know. Mm -hmm. So the first time I was like, Philip Seymour Hoffman's guilty. Why would he not do this? Why would he do that? Blah, blah, blah. This film is different. I don't think the film conclusively gives you enough information to really determine whether or not she did, she didn't, he fell, he jumped, she pushed him, she hit him. None of that is conclusive because I think it's it's significant to the narrative, but it's not significant to the themes of the movie. And for me, this is a relationship movie. Yeah. This is about a relationship. And you know, you've been in a relationship long enough to know the way you see things and the way your wife sees things are not always the same thing. And then you see the same thing and you both have a different interpretation of it. And then I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about with the movie. And it happens a little later on in the film, so we can go back to uh, some other stuff if you want to. But there's that flashback of their argument. Yeah, which that he first, records. Right, which first of all doesn't sound like an argument to me. It sounds like you're in a relationship with somebody that you've seen naked a hundred times and you're done at this day. You're done. And you're just having a discussion. It seems reasonable and rational. He seems actually more irrational in that discussion than she does. But they're talking about the language. And he tries to say, the reason why we speak English is because you're controlling that part of our relationship. And she goes, what are you talking about? We live in your country you speak French, I speak German. The common ground is English. I thought yeah. we agreed that that was the common ground. He had a whole other concept of why she wanted to speak English and use that as something to make her feel defensive about. And she was like, wait, what? I thought this was the common, the, the fact that I'm not speaking French because I don't speak it as well. You don't speak my native tongue at all, but we live in your country and now you're telling me that we decided to speak English because I forced that on us? Wait, I don't remember it that way. That's a relationship. And for good, bad, or indifferent, this is what happens. And also, it's interesting to me that if you ever known a couple that seems to get along when they're by themselves and then when they go out to parties and stuff, they pick fights with each other and they do it in front of other people. And it's nothing major. It's just like, you know, you left your stinky socks on the living room floor when we got home today. Okay, why are you telling that? To everybody. everybody. Right. Well, your spaghetti dinner sucked tonight. You know, like they're just, you just have a tendency to pick on each other when you're with other people. So this movie is about a relationship, but it's about how other people perceive their relationship, them themselves too, but how they perceive their relationship and how people want to attach in the relationship and outside the relationship, their views about their relationship based on what they think they did and why they did it. Her book and what she writes in the book comes back to haunt her later on when it could just be something she thought up in her own mind that this would be an interesting plot line. Now, there's a separate thing that happens with her stealing from him, if you will. But the point of all of that dissertation is that relationships are very complex. Man, woman, man, man, woman, woman, friends, daughters, mothers, sons, they're all complicated. So only the two people in the relationship could possibly really evaluate where the relationship is and what it means. Now, when one is dead, that's when all of this other stuff starts to happen. Because I couldn't figure out why they even assume she might have murdered him. Like, why was that what they jumped to a conclusion of? And why did they feel like they had to investigate it like that when there was no indication at all other than this aggravating thing that he does in the beginning of the film. Yeah. Um, well, it, it's essentially a death and it's a, it's an un, 
uh, unexplained death. And so right, right there, at least I know in the United States, like that, that's something that, that gets investigated. If it's a, I mean, if it was like a heart attack, that would be one thing, but it was, it was, you know, blunt force trauma to the head, potential and, and definitely a fall of some kind and, and that, that kind of a thing. And the only person around admitted, you know, admitted by by the wife she was the only person around her and her son were the only people around like she didn't ever even say like oh you know johnny came over and hung out with him and then he was dead and then my husband was dead and johnny left you know she never even said that so but but either and then also on top of all that is that you know most of the time when there is a suspicious death it 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 may relate the it may be related to the closest you know the closest uh, person in a relationship, whether it's significant other, you know, son, father, whatever. Um, so, so yeah, that, I, I think all that stuff together is why she was a person of interest. And then with the recording, you know, and it being so close to, uh, the, the, his death, that's, that's when they, that once they found the recording, that's when they, uh, charged her with, uh, with that, that crime. But didn't she become a suspect because they couldn't put together how the fall happened and the blood splatter? It was all about that blood splatter in the beginning. Yeah. Like they couldn't figure out how that would happen if he wasn't. Yeah, the coroner pushed. said. Yeah, the, the medical examiner said that That's right. it was it was due to blunt force that happened before the fall, as right. opposed to um, you know when when he hit the ground. Okay, it's not okay. that him hitting the ground caused the blunt force trauma. It was blunt force trauma then him hitting the ground. Which, if you look at it from the the point of view of she, she killed him, then she could have smacked him with a lead pipe in the conservatory, you know, whatever. But she could have hit hit him and then he stupid. fell over. That's and stupid. He, okay, <laughs> I love that game by the way. Clue master detective till I die. Um, yeah. But uh, the but so the uh, she could have hit him and then he fell and then you know whatever died on the way down uh or he could have fallen on his own or jumped on his own and hit the shed which could have been the blunt force trauma and then crawled to the spot spot where he laid out so like they they did a good job of keeping it even like not making it like this is obviously what happened and this is obviously not what happened like but but like you said it's it's about the it's about more about the relationship and it's about perception and really it's ultimately um about truth and about the court system and about where truth lies in the court system because uh, there one of the lines was um uh it was where is it uh what you know what is truth uh doesn't matter the courtroom is not a place for truth it's a place for fiction that's in the movie and that right there is is something that I never really heard it uh, said that way or expressed that way. But ultimately, you have two competing sides, and each side wants the jury to to you know to to agree with them. So ultimately, one side is going to be wrong, but both sides are presenting uh, their case like they are right. So so that right there means that it's. The truth is defined in a courtroom. The truth is defined by the jury or by if it's a jury case by the jury and and by the judge, if it's the judge. So so all of that kind of means that in a courtroom, you're more like if you're on one side or the other, you're more worried about how you are going to sway the jury or the judge versus what actually is true. And so that is something that is not you know, ideally everyone would be for truth all the time, but that's not the case in court ever because there's always two sides and each side wants to win. So that right there was a whole, you know, in this movie takes it to its extreme to where um, once we start getting into closer to the end of the film and, and Danielle and what he has to determine how, he, how he determines how he's going to move forward with his testimony that ultimately defines the truth. So, um, and he ha- and and that he has to live with that, and that his m- mom will will live with that uh, going forward. Well, the fact that that's so layered too is uh, interesting and perplexing and complex. Because is he remembering what he says he remembers? Did it happen the way it that it happened? Matter. 
It doesn't right. matter. Well, no, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. I totally get what you're saying. But I'm saying from an audience point of view, I was not convinced that he didn't just make that up because of the result that he could get by making it up. Yeah. And we're talking and, about the well, an, an end yeah. part to the movie that might be confusing well, to people I, who, I don't, think we who can haven't be a little, seen it. Yeah, we can be a little more generic. But I think that for me, Daniel is... Uh, he, I, I characterized him as the fulcrum of the film. Like he is the point at which the film rotates and we go into the movie, at least I went into the movie, uh, assuming that I was going to be more, that the film was going to rotate around the, the mother or rotate around the wife. And that's not the case. Like the, she ultimately doesn't really have any power whatsoever. And the way that, that her and her husband, like how their relationship was is that she was um blunt and and matter of fact and you could tell in that recording like the way that they interacted with each other you know she was you know uh drier and and just very you know like i said matter of fact just just <laughs> laying it out there which is not sensitive and it's not uh anything uh that is how you how i could have assumed that 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 how i may have assumed that that relationship would have gone or a relationship in film would have gone and so that right there is a, is another wrinkle and so people can put that on her and say oh she is you know cold or distant or whatever um but but we we're also learning more about their relationship and as it's grown uh going back to how are how are they able to distill each of these characters in such a small period of time and can you make an evaluation on someone just by a handful of 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 interactions that we are privy to as viewers and now the the jury is expected to do the same thing so and that's going to determine her freedom or her incarceration so it gets it gets really hairy and there and all of the like the physical evidence is not there's not enough like you said to grab onto to be like this is definitely how it happened it really reminded me of another documentary that was made by a french filmmaker the staircase that was set right up the road here in in durham um about the michael peterson case so they made a movie about that they did well they made a um uh, like Colin Firth and yeah. uh, Tony Collette uh, yeah. were in it on HBO. It was a miniseries, yeah. Um, but the documentary is actually really, really well done. And it's pretty old; it's from like I don't know about twenty years ago. But, um, but yeah, it, uh, it it's a similar thing where like there's there's enough elements to it where it's like I can see where there might have been a motive, but then the, also like, you know, this person, whether it's the the wife in this movie or Michael Peterson in the staircase situation, is is just, you know, a little bit it's not 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 necessarily like his interaction with the camera is not necessarily what you would consider quote unquote normal. Um and and there's extenuating circumstances with him especially back then in, in North Carolina, it turns out he was uh, bisexual, and that was something that the North Carolina courts just couldn't handle, I guess, at the time. So um, so there's complexities with that case. There's complexities with this case with how she writes and, and what she writes and the fact that she may have plagiarized from, uh, from his, a, a, a book, a potential book of his. So all of that gets rubbed into the stew and then... Uh, and spun around and then we as an audience the jury as the jury in the film and daniel in uh, uh, as the son all have to figure out like where we stand but um but yeah so i think that and daniel is kind of like our you know uh audience surrogate too and and so normally we're kind of asked as an audience like what do you think but we get to see daniel figure out how his family is going to look in real time and what he's going to do to to either uh you know uh contribute to his mother's incarceration or to contribute to her freedom and we get to see that you know in the film so it's what did you think about how it was shot and um uh, did, was were the courtroom scenes dynamic enough? Did you feel what did you feel about the pace of the film? I guess is where I'm getting at. Like, 
I didn't feel like it slowed down when we got to the courtroom scenes, but I could see an uh, I could see a potential for it really like bogging down once you get to the courtroom scenes. Well, the courtroom scenes, I don't know how the courts are run there, but I know yeah. that the courts are not run the way that we produce TV shows and the way that, you know, no. you see, I mean, I've been in family court many times, not myself, but with other people. Well, myself too, but, um, nothing bad anyway. So it's not, it's very clinical. It's very structured. It is, there's no time for judge Judy. There's no time for like exposition about your life. These are the facts. This is the way that it works. Uh, this, this, this is 0.52 of the law, blah, 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 blah. It's all very clinical. So it was kind of nice to see a court, which seemingly is that in this film, because I don't, no, I mean, there was some dramatic stuff. The other lawyer or prosecutor, um, you know, he's very flamboyant in some of his approach, but I think he was trying to do the I got you type of thing. And a couple of times it worked and a couple of times it didn't. But no, because I was glad that it didn't get glossed over and seem superficial like some courtroom dramas in American films uh, or in past films, let's put it that way, have been... Uh, uh, prime example, the Chicago seven, mm -hmm. you know, everything about, uh, uh, the killers of flower moon, um, mm -hmm. the courtroom scene, ah, you know, it's very bombastic and very, I know I did that on purpose. Um, I'm beside him. I'm on his side, but I get why everybody is having problems with that anyway. Um, but everything is so courtroom. Oppenheimer does the exact same thing. The way the camera sweeps in and comes around to the defendant or sweeps in and comes around to the person testifying in this, it just seemed very structured and very much like, because there's a lot of locked on shots of just the judges or whoever those people are. Well, there's a judge in the center and then the jury was beside okay, the judge. Okay, that's, what I, that's yeah. what I thought, which was weird to me just because that's yeah. unusual uh for us but there was no like swooping in when there's a reaction shot from what she was something was happening it was all she was here the lawyer was here or the two other lawyers were down by side her and then the prosecutor if that's what he's called was mm -hmm. over here and it was never overly dramatic and so it made me listen harder it made me focus on the content of what they were saying uh, more than the dramaticness of, oh, you know, when we shoot to somebody else or liar, yeah. liar is a prime example of over the top antics in a courtroom, <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, uh, well, a couple of things that I noticed is that uh, uh, Justine Trier, I'm going to just keep saying that because I, so I, I listened it to it. So nice. I listened to it before we started the podcast. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, she puts the camera in in specific points. It get, essentially gives the audience the point of view of the of the character who she wants us to uh, to associate with in, in individual, uh, scenes. There are certain shots, it, uh, especially like when we were listening to the recording, uh, there, there were a lot of shots from the, the gallery, which is where the son was sitting at and looking at his mom. Like we were essentially next to the son as the audience and, and looking at the mom. So we were getting her her uh the kids view of her or when there were cross examinations of uh the the mom and and we were seeing the prosecutor from that you know from that side uh or if it was the judge we were seeing the judge potentially either from the defendant's side or from the uh the uh witness's side or the person who is uh who's testifying there there where they are at in the center of the frame there was only a couple times i saw like one kind of dolly move that was in kind of the it was at the point of view of the uh judge and kind of pointing kind of between the prosecutor and the defendant lawyer um so there were a couple of camera moves but it was mainly like you said locked off shots and and a little bit of pans and stuff but but it also felt uh, dynamic to me because like you said, it's different than our courtrooms where normally in our courtrooms, like my cousin Vinny, it's like, you can't just like, if, if the prosecution is, is interrogating a witness, like the defense can't just like, 
jump in and ask a question or vice versa. If right. the defense is talking to their, you know, their client who's on the stand essentially, then you can't just like jump into the prosecution and be like, answer my question right now. Like that's not how it's done here in the United States, but it seems like that's how it's done in France. And it her makes too. it more dynamic. She's, she spoke back a couple of times. She, she was did. like, I she need was... to say a yeah. thing here. Yeah. 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 And then she went on a long speech about what she was talking about at one point. Well, when and that's wasn't even her talking at first. And the other thing that was, you're right, that wasn't even, they, nobody was addressing her, but then she just kind of like blurts out whatever she needs yeah. to say. And the other thing that I thought was really cool is the way that they utilize language in this film. Because, yeah. and it's very similar to, it's very similar to The Handmaiden and very similar to, um, uh, what's the other uh, films? Oh my gosh, I was just thinking about it. Uh, I guess Parasite does it a little bit, but um, but there's the way that, that language is used to to differentiate between certain situations the fact that she is german like we can't we we can't gloss over the fact that she is german she is in france and she can't speak french well enough to express herself properly in the court of law like you can't say things like if you are fighting for your freedom for your life for you know to prove that you did not kill your husband which on top of having to defend yourself you're still dealing with the grief of losing your husband losing your son's father like sandra holler has to do all of that by the way on top of speak french and speak english <laughs> And which she doesn't speak a lick of German in this film, I don't think. So, I mean, geez. So, but the fact that she has to, and she even says, like, she starts off all of the time in, in the courtroom, she starts off in French, and then she's like, I, I have to switch. I have to go to English. And then, right, because, because they tell her at the beginning, you have to speak proper yep. French or fluent French and be clear and understandable because they're going to hold that against you, period. Yes. If you speak your native tongue or English, they're going to hold that against you. But she can't do it she because... She can't do it. Yeah, and, and not, so I mean, that's really that's really perplexing to think that because somebody can't speak a native language that they can't be heard properly. But we're humans. That's what we do. But and so the the fact that it like those are those are uh, very critical points. Um, even the fact, even the very first scene, which we never even really talked about, her the interview of the uh, the the girl who was interviewing her for her uh, thesis, um, and they were speaking in English. I and when I saw the trailer, I remember seeing the trailer, and you know where where she kind of you know the the big scene where she says like, "Stop! I did not kill my husband," and that's all in English. And then, the, you know, the, her, you know, her lawyer friend is like, that's not the point. You know, that's all in English. So uh, but then obviously the film, you know, people are speaking French and all this stuff. And she does speak French and she speaks French to her son. And um, but she also speaks English to her son. So it, it's it's so much more complex. And and it's it's another tool in the toolkit that Justine Trier gets to play with that we just don't. Like in the United States, like we just don't because there's just the default that everybody's going to speak English and there's no, like we don't get that extra little spice that she's able to put it, her and her partner, uh, who did I, did I already say his name? Um, the lawyer or the no, 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 husband, no. her partner, no, her partner who helped her write the film. Like they co-wrote the film. Oh, oh, Arthur oh, oh. Harari. Um, they, he's also an actor and I think he was even in the film in a small part. But, um, but yeah, th so they've, uh, I think this may be the first time that they've, uh, collaborated this, this closely on, on a script, but, uh, I also was watching some, uh, interviews and she said that they started writing this like right around the time the lockdown started. So you can imagine, uh, you know, I don't know if they're husband and wife, but at, at the very least partners who share a child, uh, and uh, maybe I have a couple of kids, uh, who are co-writing this film, in the lockdown who can't get away from each other and they've got kids around, you know, or a kid around, like I would think that that would be a bit maddening for them. So, well, that's look what they got though. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, now, now it all, that all makes perfect sense Yeah, that I had no idea that that was a backstory. And, but what's interesting about that to me is that it's interesting. And also that that's sort of 
something they talk about in the film. They talk about her book and this so-called murder in the book uh, that is similar to what they think happened between her and her husband. And she's like, that's fiction. You know, Mm -hmm. I made that up for the book. And, you know, it's strange that it's uh, fiction has become fact, but it has nothing to do with the fact that that proves that I'm a murderer. It just happens to be. And then they make the point in the film that we do that all the time. We take our lives and we put them into uh, movies and art forms and all that other stuff. That's what writers do. That doesn't make them guilty of murder. That makes them clever at being creative about the things that they've been given in their life. So it's that makes it even more layered that I know that these two people have some kind of interpersonal relationship. They have a kid, so they mm-hmm. definitely have a relationship that I don't understand. Like, I, I don't have a kid with somebody, so I have no idea. And then they're in lockdown together. I mean, it... I'm wondering what some of the drafts of this film were like. I mean, yeah, you know, they, they definitely in in their Q and A's because they've done multiple Q and A's together. They're kind of like, well, we've done that and that's done. So like, it doesn't seem like they're gonna do this again, uh, write a movie together. But you know, that's until that's they fine. both win Oscars for this one, and then they're like, well, maybe we should try. I mean, let's, let's write our experience about never writing again together. <laughs> I haven't yeah. looked at, I haven't really like dug deep on the, you know, the, cause I would think that a lot of the movies that are coming out now are adapted. Um, even the Greta Gerwig, Noah Baumbach, Barbie script is technically adapted, right? Nah, they're going back and forth. That I think they're submitting it as original. Well, that, okay. Well, that might be hard, but the, I, I, I I mean, there this there is always is so the well film. Done. Yeah. yeah, there's always a film out there that if it wins Barbie for original screenplay, we would be happy with it. But sure. then there's a film like this that comes along that ends up winning, and you can't really argue it. You can't say, "Oh, it didn't deserve it over Barbie," or however they the competition works in people's minds. It's just the way it works. It's like when we were talking about original screenplays during Parasite. I can't even remember what most of them were um, at this point. And nobody really thought, well, some people thought- It was like Knives Out, Little Women. Right, right. And, and, you know, Knives Out would have been a great winner, but once Parasite won, you were like, of course, that is- That was original though. So it was, uh, yeah, it was Marriage Story, uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood- those those movies and, and then oh that's right because yeah. knives out was adapted because well, no, no, no. The fir- no, it was the first one. knives out that right. was the first okay. one yeah so those right. were all okay. in the stew together yeah how do yeah. you even i mean and then parasite wins and you go yep. of course if once upon a time in hollywood had won you'd be like okay yeah that deserved it but parasite won and you're like of course that won. just like if this wins we'll be like of course because this is really almost too complex for its own good because it just swirls around in your brain so much that you can't get a conclusion. But I think that's the point because there is no conclusion to relationships and there's no conclusions to life there unless, unless you die. And there's still no conclusions. Yeah. And people's lives are way more complex than a two and a half hour long movie can, can handle. And that's, I think what this movie is essentially saying. It's like, you know, if you were expecting to come in here and getting just like a rubber stamp encyclopedia Brown, this is exactly what the, what the problem was. And this is what the answer is. Like, you're not going to get that. Like this movie is, is meant to be a movie that you watch and then you go and you have coffee and a piece of pie and you like dig into what the hell you just saw and and all of the the you know explanations and all of the permutations associated with that the, it's it's a it's a thinking movie and it's a complex movie and it's not meant to just be like a you know <laughs> a romp or whatever you right know? well i'm i'm probably going to find it interesting that this if this happens to me after making this statement i am what's the word i'm looking for i i would be more weary of a person who's like, she did it. Or a person who was like, no, she didn't do it. Anybody who's that defined in what they think happened in this film, I would be more worried about them than somebody who's trying to figure out, well, did she, did she not? Was this really about their relationship? What was this film about? The, the complexities of the film 
uh, like you said, bode well for conversations. And we thought we had the answers. It was the questions we had wrong. Are we asking the right questions about this film? But anybody comes out of this film and goes, she definitely did it. I would be more cautious of that person. And now watch, I'm going to have a bunch of friends who are going to see this film and be like, she did it. And I'll be like, okay. <laughs> I just, I just can't. I just can't see how from what is divulged in this film, I can't see how anybody could be 100% certain with what exactly happened. Because when the son comes in to testify, it's, it changes everything. Because you, and the, the, the thing that it changes is you want to believe him. Mm-hmm. Because you want her to be innocent, or at least I did, because you don't want her to be the kind of person who can commit cold-blooded murder and still be as solid and have such normalcy about herself from that point on. There's no neurosis when it comes to her character after the murder or the fall happens Mm -hmm. or the suicide. But I also don't think they do a great job at, um, or they don't do a specific job at making me convinced that he committed suicide because I can't see what the reasonings behind why. First of all, he's a very good looking man with those blue eyes. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Like it can't be that bad. Can it? Well, I don't know psychologically. And I don't mean to downplay anybody's, um, life and how it can be hard regardless of whether or not having blue yeah. eyes i'm being i'm being superficial but mm, he's a very good but i think man. you're right though those but having those pictures of him and her together and all that that helps to to ingratiate you and and let you understand that like these people did have you know yeah. these two people did have a relationship they had a bond together and cuz you only get that one that one scene the really the one like interaction that they have on screen the only time he's actually moving on screen is the argument and only half of the argument that's the other thing that she does is she cuts off the the you know the the video portion of the argument we don't see once it gets contentious they they cut back to the courtroom oh that's right the fight and the actual yes, fight fight the, the actual, actual fight we don't yeah. hear so her explanation is he's hitting himself cuz you hear a bunch of uh you know rhythmic you know repeated slaps and she says he's hitting himself that could be him hitting her, that could be her hitting him, that could be him hitting himself. Like, there's a bunch of different options to what could have actually happened. But the fact that we don't know, that we are in the same position as the son, we are in the same position as the jury, all we have is what she says and what we hear. And and ultimately, when when you hear something, you're going to you're going to expand that in your mind to be whatever it is, the worst case scenario or the most novel situation that it is when when it could just be oh that was just a chair just like squeaking on the floor no that's some sort of animal that's inside the house get out you know like it, it's that kind of a thing so that right there is, is just a perfect choice and then the second thing that she does is during that kid's uh testimony when he starts talking about his uh drive to the vet with his dad when snoop got sick when his dog got sick and how his and he's explaining how his dad was using essentially using Snoop as a an allegory or as as a stand in for him. Well, maybe Snoop's going to get tired one day. Maybe Snoop's not going to want to help you. Maybe Snoop's Snoop's just going to need to go away and not be here. You're going to have to get ready for that. All of that stuff. The fact that that Justine Trier decides to put put have him on screen, have the dad on screen and the kid's voice that's it, great. Uh, it there's so many layers to that because so you can great. take that. I I've listened to uh, I listened to some interviews and one interviewer was like, oh well, you know, like it it was it was good that the kid you know was uh, was saying like he he took it in a totally different manner than what I took it. I took it as the kid was breathing like was giving that was. Uh, birthing that scenario into existence. Right. See, that's why I said what I said earlier. Yep. When I said did that it did that exist? It, did it exist or did he make that up to help his mother become innocent? Exactly. Like you can't you can't tell. That's you how I took it. But that's yeah. not how this interviewer person took it. No. So I cannot that, define oh, it's open what to, I thought. Yeah. It's open to uh, in, interpretation, which is amazing. Well, so think cool. about this. 
think about going back to her testimony about the argument that you don't see the uh, slaps and the stuff breaking and stuff like that. She very clearly point blank factually says that's him hitting himself. Mm -hmm. That's this. That's that. That's this. That's that. If she killed him and did the things that they said she did, what kind of sociopath is is she because she convinced me at that moment because she was so quick. Uh, let me explain. This was this, this was that, this was this, this was that. But, but she, she, cl- she also she, said the same thing when, when they're like, Oh, I saw that you had a, a bruise on your arm. And she's like, Oh yeah. When I oh, walk yeah, past she the, lied. when I walk past the, the countertop, I hit my arm on there is all the time. You can ask my son. Like I, I have bruises on there all the time. It's the same. Ooh. Same pitch, same Ooh. way that she and said she it. She does it so convincingly when yep. she shows somebody where she, but then there she says go. that was a lie and that he did that during that fight. <gasps> oh, <laughs> wow. That kind of changes some things right there. So anyway, we're about 50 minutes into well, this podcast yeah. and I want to get to something, but sure. if you've got something else you want to talk about, I just have to know what it, what your interpretation of, because I think it's the key to the film, but mm. I don't know. Do you know what I'm getting ready to talk about? Go for it. The very opening shot with the dog coming down the stairs, looking, seeing something he shouldn't be seeing, kind of shyly gets the ball and goes back upstairs. What was that all about? I don't That's remember the... that shot. <laughs> I don't, I really don't remember that shot. It's, I'm sure it's the key to the film. I'm sure of it. But I don't know what it meant because he falls out of the upstairs, the third floor, yeah. right? And we know that the second floor is their bedroom and the son's bedroom. And then they have to go up that crickety yep. thing that she's holding on to to get over to the window, um, yeah. which I found very fascinating that she so specifically grabs something then walks and then she's looking for something. So she's not comfortable up there, or at least she made it seem like she wasn't comfortable up there. Mm -hmm. So she was going towards him and fighting with him up there and threw him out that window. No, 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 she wouldn't. No, no, she didn't throw. They're not saying that she threw him out of the third floor window. They're saying she threw him over the banister in the second floor. Their bedroom has a, their bedroom has a a padded, like a banister. The key is the dog in the beginning because okay. what is he seeing? What the, does he on the see? First floor? No, well, oh yeah, it is the first floor, isn't it? Yeah, so it's the it's, first floor. So I don't. Yeah. So the first floor, then the second floor is where the banister is, and where the bedrooms are, and then the third floor is what he's is working with the on. triangle window. Yes. Yeah. Which they never really, not to change the subject, but because I'm so confused right now, I'm like, wait, I thought I had it and then it went. But they never really explore the fact that he might have just fallen. Well, that, that's you know? the thing. I think there's multiple options. There's, there's, he, he could have just tripped. He could have tripped out of the third floor window. He could have fallen t- totally. Um, he could have, he could have committed suicide. Uh, there, there's so many different things. He could have been working on something. He could have, lost his balance he could have you know hit his head and then reeled backwards and there's so many different options that's the thing is that it doesn't matter like at this point her husband is dead that kid's father is dead that's all that matters and then that's where the kid makes the decision i'm i'm going to do all i can to keep my mother out of jail and to keep my mother in the house. And I think that that's where he, and that he's willing to live with it because the, 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 um, the guardian, whatever her name is, you know, she essentially says that, uh, you know, she needs to, she tells, um, what's his name? She, she tells Daniel, she's like, he needs to, to determine like what he, uh, what he can live with, you know, like to, to make a decision, like she's saying, you have to make a decision. You may have thought something and then you may have remembered it one way and now you're remembering it a different way and you're not really sure which way it actually was. You know, which one was true, which one was was the right thing that you remembered happening. But ultimately what it comes down to is you have to choose one or the other because that's what's going to determine you know, your, your mother, it was going to potentially determine your mother's freedom. So the, so there's that is, is the, that's the complex part of the film. So really to me, 
it doesn't matter whether he fell or she killed him. It really doesn't. Because ultimately what we as an audience are worried about at that moment is that kid and that kid's relationship with his mother and how that's going to change at the end of the film. So, um, you know, and even the mother like is kind of like at the close to the end of the film, she kind of like sits at his bed and says like, I'm not a monster, you know? So, because you know, that kid has, has heard them fight before. Sure. So, you know, the, and, and so that kid knows, you know, what the potential, uh, of, of their emotions are and all of those things. But the biggest thing, um, that, that I thought was, was interesting is that, uh, and I think it was, I think they were talking about, it was Justine Trier talking about like, uh, the, and, and it was also, it's that scene after she, she wins the case. Um, uh, when Sandra Holler is at the Chinese restaurant or whatever with, with her, uh, her lawyer. And she's like, you know, if I would have been, uh, prosecuted, if I, if I would have been found guilty, that's it, it's done, it's over. But now that she's found innocent, she has to live with the fact that she is innocent and free and and there's there's that extra complexity and there's that extra piece that is that unresolved part of her life that is gonna have to to live on because there isn't a there isn't a definitive, you know answer for people like whether she did it or not essentially because even if she's uh even if she's is innocent you know as far as the court is concerned like she still has to like go on living and there's no clear um uh, result there's no clear uh conclusion to to her life at that point whereas if she was just in jail for the rest of her life that's a clear conclusion to her life but so well, I for think- other people for well, everybody who's going to be gossiping about it and stuff well, like that. For her, it might not be because she's going to be trying to prove her innocence. For well, she may I be, get what you're saying, though. She may be, you know, yes, appealing and all that stuff. But it, but it's essentially like the hard path is winning the case. And that's what she did. And that would, that's the hard path. You know, the easier path would have been just like, oh, they said I was guilty and now I'm just going to be in jail for the rest of my life. Whatever. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> See, the movie is so complex because even that scene where she goes to eat, she says right before that, I can't wait to get home to my son. That's my goal. And then she spends a couple of hours drinking and eating and socializing with this lawyer guy who she obviously starts to flirt with at some point along the lines. They have something going on towards each other, some kind of chemistry that they can't involve themselves in because it's unprofessional or because it's not right or because it's not what we should be focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. But there's some kind of um, uh, chemistry between the two. And she takes all that time to get back home because she calls the son and or to the assistant or the whatever and says, can I come home basically? And then she goes, okay, we're going to go get something to eat. I thought she was saying we're coming to get you and we're going to all go get Mm -hmm. something to eat. But then you see the scene where she's eating with him by themselves. And I was like, well, wait a second. Why is she taking such a long time to get home? Because she couldn't wait to get home to her son. See, so I'm starting to talk myself into an opinion about what I think about this movie, whether or not, yeah, it, I got it. I it said doesn't the matter. Of- well, yeah, like it does. The fact that she essentially owes her freedom to her son, and that her she doesn't even really know what her son thinks about her, because just because her son testified in her on her behalf doesn't mean that her son doesn't think that she killed. Well, not less dad. than forty eight hours before that, or however long before that, she says he says I don't want you in the house. Yep. Tell her she can't stay in the house anymore. Yep. So she goes and stays at a hotel for the weekend before the yeah. verdict and the weekend before he testifies. I thought that that was because I mean it's alluded to that it's because he thinks she's guilty sure. and like she can't face you know and also she does break that rule at one point and starts to talk to him about certain things that she should yeah. be talking to him about and they. Uh, the guardian at litem i don't even know what that other lady's called the guardian um yeah. she says no you can't do that you can't and she was like i talking to my son mother to son and shuts her down but she's saying semi inappropriate things that i thought meaning towards the case and mm-hmm. i thought this is going to be brought up later on that she did do this and that blah 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 but you know the more and more i talk about it the more and more 
I thought I didn't have an idea. And I agree with you. It doesn't matter whether or not she's guilty or not. It doesn't matter whether or not she's murdered the guy or not. Of course, morally speaking, it matters. Well, but, she has to live with that, but that's she's right. the only one who has to live with that. Right. Well, yeah. The son or, has to live with the re- the son has to live with the result of it, but he has to live with the result of it no matter what. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Uh, and I go back to my original idea that it is about a relationship and this is a relationship movie and this is how we analyze and the court is just a, uh, a metaphor for how we analyze other people's relationships and how we butt our nose into people's relationships and we give people opinions and we say things and we take sides and all that other stuff and then we change sides and then we lie. I mean, we do a lot of things with interpersonal relationships, as I said before. But if you are on a quest to try to figure out how you feel about whether or not she did it or not, if that's the quest, because via our conversation for the last hour, I've started to really question some of the things that she does. I'm not saying it makes her guilty or not guilty, and it's not significant to to the, to the conversation we're having. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's the, uh, is significant to the conversation at large about the film. But she does do some things that make you go, that's interesting and that's questionable. And things are done to her and things, that conversation that she has with the uh, interviewer in the beginning seems like an innocent thing about the f- husband being frustrated and angry and and being a baby and uh, mm-hmm. playing music too loud to interrupt her, her moment, being jealous or whatever. And then you find out that that's more complex because, uh, you know, Sandra, Sandra is bisexual and has had an affair w- with a woman only one time, but it wasn't only one time. I mean, it's yep. just like, ah, the point though is that you're right. Only they will know. And only the son has to deal with what he has to deal with. But it is an interesting case study to think about where my moral barometer falls with what I saw in the film and not judging and not, you know, pointing a finger at anybody. I'm saying that she does some interesting questionable things interestingly questionable things that could sway you one way or another and they never do sway you one way or another how do you do that in a film and then make it interesting for two hours but they did it and it's all in the screenplay so bravo yeah i mean it's yeah it's too it's too complex to boil down and that's why it just needs to be seen so hopefully it'll get I mean, I know it's gotten like a decent uh, showing here, but hopefully people will be able to see it on streaming because I know it's for a lot of people, especially in the United States, it's a big ask to go to a foreign film in the theater, but it's it, I, it, it's definitely worth it. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And I did want to see it again because I know there's so much that I'm missing, um, but I think that the use of the music, like the score is very sparse. There's barely any score. And the score they do use is the son playing the piano. And the fact that it gets more and more frantic as the film goes on, because he's learning that piece at the beginning. Yeah. So it's very slow and methodical. But by the end, he is like going crazy on those keys. And so, and it just keeps that that tension, you know, building throughout the film. So it's such a great, great job. And like you said, the dog was also very, very good. The the dog actor well, did, did a great job too. Well, actually, I was wondering about that. How did they do all of that stuff with the they, tongue? I and did the- lis- yeah, I did listen to uh, uh, an interview with Justine Trier, and she uh, said that uh, that dog had been trained. I think they were training that dog for six months to do that, to, to be able to do that. I thought, cause really? I mean, my wife being a vet, I thought yeah. that they would have sedated the dog, but the fact that the dog has to immediately react, which is not realistic, you know, cause they're like, Oh, pour some salt water down their throat. It's like, no, that's not that that wouldn't happen. But for the sake of the movie that that's what they did. So the dog was able to kind of like roll their eyes back and stick their tongue out. And like that, I mean, you can train dogs to do things, you know, to, to do certain things. And the particular dog was trained to, to do that is what she said. That's all I'm going by. So, okay. Well, I'm going to believe her. So the dog is acting. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's yeah. crazy. 
That's crazy. Because yep. I was like, they could not in 2023 or 2022 drug a dog. They just wow. couldn't. They I mean, don't have they the ASPCA could. in France. So well, I don't know what they've got over they there. They have human beings who understand that that's not yeah. cool. So, yeah. so I was wondering how that was working. But okay, so I challenge you to see the film again. And I ask you to pay attention to the opening scene. Okay. And I, I'm... I'm convinced. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm convinced it's the key to the film. That's and cool. not one person has mentioned it in anything that I've read. Now, nice. maybe I made it up. Maybe I saw, I don't know. Sometimes I re I watch a film again, like I said earlier, and I'm like, wait, I thought that that happened. Wait, what? You remember when we were talking about um, uh, Adam Warlock and his mother dying? Yep. I thought one thing completely happened that ne didn't happen, and I didn't understand the sequence event and I watched it again. I was like, how was I not clear on that? Mm -hmm. It literally has to do with, I looked down, looked up, ate popcorn and missed an important split, split sec. Oh. Yeah. Which altered what I had seen, but I'm almost 99% convinced that there is a sequence. The ball comes down the stairs and then the dog comes down and then the dog goes to go get the ball and looks up but kind of is hunched like, wait, I'm not supposed to be seeing what I'm supposed to be seeing. Scurries over just kind of low to the ground to get the ball and then goes back upstairs. All I right. swear that happens in okay. the beginning of this film. I'll take a look. If it doesn't, what the hell? I'm, my life is not what I think it is. I'm in the Matrix. Oh, geez. All right. So best screenplay, best original screenplay, best actress? No. Best actress. Definite. You think so? Winning? No, no, Winning no. I'm just saying nominated. Oh, hands down, absolutely. Okay. That's cool. That's great. I'm, I'm 100%. glad. One hundred percent. And uh, I won't be surprised if they do eight, nine pictures. It's best picture. Yeah. Um, don't they don't have to do ten? Don't they have to do ten pictures? No, now? they don't have to do ten. Oh, oh, do they have to do ten now? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I cannot. Who knows? They changed that. <laughs> it's so confusing. I'm like. Yeah. Pick five. Who cares? Whatever. <laughs> I mean, okay, it's great. Ten. You you know, you can have a tenth film. It's a marketing tool. I get exactly. that. Exactly. Um, and your Justine, don't be surprised with best director. I watch hope so. watch the DGAs come out and her be on the list. Now, will she win? Who knows? Because you got Scorsese, you got a ton of people in that well, in and that I know like world. Greta Zone Gerwig. of interest. Yeah. Greta Gerwig. Zone of interest will be interesting because that'll be kind of like that's Jonathan Glazer who who did uh, uh, Sexy Beast Under the Skin. Uh, I love and those movies. He hasn't been back for a while, and this is a big one for him. So we'll get to see how all that. Also starring Sandra Huller. Boom. Oh, there you go. There She's you go. She's the wife of whatever Hess, the guy who was the head of Auschwitz. And oh, and oh, yeah, they are yeah, they're heard living like him and his wife are raising their children like in the shadow of Auschwitz, and they're like, oh, this is an idyllic place to raise our kids, like that, and that's what the movie is about. So that sounds like the boy with the striped pajamas. Oh, you ever heard of that film? I've heard of that, yes. And there, I guess there's, yeah. I anyway, so we'll I, talk off screen because I vowed to tell everybody the plot of that story so they wouldn't have to be. I don't want to see that movie, and I'm yeah. not really like because it's Jonathan Glazer. I'm like, God, that guy, he's so good. He is good. He's such a great filmmaker, and so it's like, man, I'm gonna have to watch this movie. But it, subject matter is so rough. But and don't be surprised if the young, uh, the young boy is nominated too. Okay, it's gonna be Robert. Uh, I almost said Robert Redford, Robert Downey Jr. and Ryan Gosling going neck and neck fighting. Yeah. Yeah. But watch out because there is always that one performance that people do not pay attention to. And then once they win or once they're nominated, they go, oh, hey, wait, who's this? Oh, yeah. He was great. Watch. Mm. Watch. All right. uh, and, uh, cinematography, too. Yeah. Cinematography, too. Yeah. Uh, last thing I'll say, we didn't say it, but. The movie's title, Anatomy of Falls, a play on Anatomy of a Murder. Great Otto Preminger movie with uh, James Stewart, like Jimmy Stewart. And, uh, you know, it, Lee Remick. Yeah, Lee Remick and Ben Gazzara. Like, that's yeah. a great movie. Pushed the boundaries of film at that time. Also, uh, a dynamic courtroom drama that has very similar themes of like what actually happened. Let's figure it out in the courtroom as opposed to like we're going to spoon feed it to you. So um, if people are looking for another movie to see like Natty Moon Murder, great film. 
awesome score done by Duke Ellington. So, yeah. Uh, you got anything else? No, I'm good. Awesome. All right. Well, you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com. You can go to facebook.com slash actorandengineer. You can find us on YouTube. Just search for the Actor and Engineer podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.